This is Floss Weekly. I'm Doc Searles. This week, Catherine Druckmann and I talk with Paul Mutton of Netcraft, which is a company I've been following for like 25 years or something like that. He's been with it for 17 years. He is a cybercrime warrior of the very first order. Just a fabulous guest. If you care about cybercrime, if you care about security online, care about any of that stuff, this is required listening. And that is coming up next. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This is Floss Weekly, episode 653, recorded Wednesday, October 27th, 2021. Web servers and cybercrime. This episode of Floss Weekly is brought to you by Bitwarden. Get the password manager that offers a robust and cost-effective solution that can drastically increase your chances of staying safe online. Get started with a free trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan or get started for free across all devices as an individual user at bitwarden.com slash twit. Hello again and good morning, good evening, good whenever it is, wherever you are. I am Doc Searles. This is Floss Weekly and I am joined this week by Catherine Druckmann herself. There she is. <laughs> with her Drupal plushie in the background. You're, you're yes. home in Houston, More I assume, one. right now? I yeah. am. Yeah. And I'm in Texas. I, I've survived a Texas. tornado warning early this morning. It woke me up. Yeah. I'm Just another day. Those, eh? I'm in Bloomington, Indiana here and uh, just uh, one time zone to the east, but it's a weird time zone. I'm the far western part of it. So the sun, the sun sets late and is up, up late as well. It's kind of strange for me. But anyway, so our, our guest today is Paul Mutton of, of, uh, of Netcraft. And you and I have a, a long acquaintance, at least I do, at, at Linux Journal for many years. Mm. I made copious use of data just monthly data that they published that did you keep up yeah. with netcraft during that time or are you too busy uh, ca- yeah there? i mean not so much i think i i probably <laughs> the most i kept up with it was probably through the stuff that you wrote and, and drew our attention mm-hmm. to well and i, I want to because we're getting a, a little bit of a late start i want to jump into the show which means that i have to tell you that this episode of floss weekly is brought to you by bitwarden Bitwarden is the only open source cross-platform password manager that can be used at home, at work, or on the go and is trusted by millions. Empower your employees to follow password management best practices. With Bitwarden, you can securely store credentials across personal and business worlds. Every Bitwarden account begins with the creation of a personal vault. Use Bitwarden for your business. It's fully customizable. Adjust features using enterprise policies to adapt to your business needs. Use Bitwarden Send, a fully encrypted method to transmit sensitive information, whether text or files, directly to anyone. Team members can generate unique and secure passwords for every site. You'll get enterprise-grade security and their GDPR, CCPA, HIPAA, and SOC 2 compliant. Their end-to-end encrypted vault helps mitigate phishing attacks by storing passwords and more. Bitwarden now has new tools for managed service providers. Bitwarden's new provider portal allows MSPs to easily manage clients' password management services all in one place. It allows for simple access to each separate organization. Two new user types allow for delegation of management and ensure clear differentiation between the service provider and client users. Interested in a business plan? Well, Bitwarden has plans that will work for you. Their team's organization option is $3 a month per user, where you can store private data securely with your coworkers, department, or entire organization. For enterprises, use Bitwarden's enterprise organization plan for just $5 a month per user. Their free organization plan includes two users who can store and share secure passwords. Bitwarden believes that everyone should have access to their basic password security tools. Individuals can use their basic free account forever for an unlimited number of passwords or upgrade any time to their premium account for less than $1 a month. And if you're looking for a secure password storage for your entire family, their family organization option gives up to six users premium features for only 
$3.33 a month. Using Bitwarden Cloud, you can get started in no time. Monitor and manage security vulnerabilities using Bitwarden Vault Health Reports. Identify exposed, reused, weak, or potentially compromised passwords, as well as any items in your vault with inactive 2FA. Get started with a free Teams or Enterprise trial of a Teams or Enterprise plan at bitwarden.com slash twit, or try it for free across devices as an individual user. That's bitwarden.com slash twit. Okay, here at Floss Weekly, I, our guest uh, this, uh, this week is uh, Paul Munton of Netcraft. Um, and I have a, a long um, journalistic relationship with Netcraft um, uh, because at Linux Journal, um, we had something called LJ Index, and we'd have a stack of, um, of stats every month about something or other. And I kept waiting for, uh, they, they have a most reliable list of all of the web hosting providers, and almost all of them were always Linux, but there was always one of them that was a Microsoft or some other thing. Recently, they finally did all 10 were, were Linux. I don't think they are this month, but in any case, um, uh, you know, but Paul, Paul is a cybersecurity consultant at Netcraft. Uh, he has a passion for web application security testing and unfolding the inner workings of cybercrime to discover new mitigation techniques. And I'm reading that from his, he provides us with an enormous amount of information and not, as, not that much about himself. So welcome, Paul, um, to, to the show. Hi there. there. Thanks for uh, inviting me. Yeah, and and I know you just got off work, so you're in the UK somewhere. Where where are you there? Yeah, um, down in sunny Wiltshire. Or well, it's starting to get a bit dark now. Um, <laughs> but thankfully, no tornado warnings down here. <laughs> yeah, I can't turn to say earlier that she, she had tornado warnings where she is, and I'm I'm in a part of the US that does get tornadoes now. Um, so so. Yeah, how long have you you've been with uh, Netcraft? A long time, I take it. Um, that- yeah, uh, about seventeen years, maybe. Um, wow, it's been quite a while. Yeah. So tell us. T- tell us. I mean, my familiarity with Netcraft is almost entirely as, um, as a, as a parasite <laughs> for, for the data that you <laughs> that you publish copiously. So tell us a bit more about it because I think it's a really interesting service. Yeah. So so all of that public stuff we publish, um, numbers of web servers and so on. That's something we've been known for since the company started, certainly before I started working for them. Um, more recently, though, we're very heavily engaged in security services. Um, we provide services to um, seven different governments to deal with things like phishing sites and um, basically things that can harm um, citizens of those governments. So, but so... Tell me about what somebody at the beginning got the idea to do something that I think um, is just a huge um, service. There's a, um, Netcraft has been publishing since 1995, August of 95, um, web server market share under web server developers. And um, I mean, it begins with, I think NCSA is like had, you know, 55% 55% of all the web servers that were measured at that time, other came in second and Apache was nowhere. And that by 96, Apache began a long period of domination. Uh, they're still doing well, but um, Microsoft edged in in uh, like 2016 or so. I'm looking at your stats here. They're really cool. And then mm-hmm. slacked off in 2018 to going down to almost nothing well. Um, now it's uh, Nginx is number one with Apache number two. What what possessed somebody? I'm curious about two things. One is what we're learning from this. And the other is what um, what possessed the founders at the first place to start doing this? Because I think it's a real service. That's a really good question. And t- to be honest, it's not even something I thought about. Um, but basically, Mike Presigeon, the director, I'm pretty sure it would have been his idea in the first place. Um He's quite keen to um, latch on to novel things that are up and coming and um, certainly knows a good opportunity when one pops up. Um, it's had a pretty long tail to it. Um, it's a very, you know, as you've heard of us before, uh, uh, for this particular thing, but um, 
the company has evolved. We do many other things as well now. Um, so the data surveying stuff is how it all started, but um, we then branched off into security, um, anti-phishing services, um, security testing and stuff like that as well. So, so okay, your your specialty is uh, is security. What, and you started seventeen years ago. What was big then versus what's big now, or is it all just one long hairball that you have to cope with for the for the duration? <laughs> um, I think pretty pretty quickly I got into um, doing web application security testing and. Um, it was something that I had a, a mild interest in before starting at Netcraft, and I think that's possibly how I ended up um, being found by the boss and emailed out of the blue anyway. Um, and I still do uh, security testing now. It's, it's possibly the thing I enjoy doing most. Um, as the company's grown, we do end up doing more security testing than we used to back then. Um, but above all, um, I'm also interested in writing about security things and over the years, I found it quite fascinating how things like um, the techniques used by criminals in phishing attacks have evolved. Because 15 odd years ago, phishing was pretty much a, um, you know, still in its infancy. Uh, we would get people to um, report phishing sites to us. And if we confirmed it as being a phishing site, we would give them a lovely Netcraft mug just for reporting that one phishing site. Um, whereas nowadays, I think um, the, the volume of phishing sites is so large that you'd have to um, submit, I think it's 250 reports now to get a mug off of us. We, um, we actually, so, so cybersecurity is obviously a very, very important topic um, and increasingly so. I wondered a few things actually, are you seeing um, are there any sort of, let's say, global events or 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 factors that that particularly uh, lead to an increase in attacks? Like I know we, you know, we've seen a, a lot of things recently. Actually, in the back channel, somebody brought up this um, npm package supply chain hack that that recently came out, and and that's just one of many, right? I mean, there there's a some sort of massive supply chain hack. Um, it seems weirdly frequently these days. Um, and I wondered if there's something leads to that, or is this just the world that we live in now? And this is, you know, the direction that we're headed. Um, in some cases, I think criminals just discover something that works and then everyone copies them. Um, I mean, things like ransomware attacks have really taken off in the past couple of years where um, mm -hmm. a criminal will compromise a server and encrypt all the data on it or all of an employee's desktop machines employ uh, encrypt those and um, hold that data to ransom effectively. If it's data that a company can't do without, then it may be in their best interest to just pay that ransom and get the decryption key so they can resume business as normal. Um, other ways that works is um, a criminal won't encrypt the data in situ, but they'll just steal copies of it, and then they'll threaten to release that data into the public, which could be quite damaging. Um, unless, of course, the um, company decides to pay a ransom to stop that happening. But that's just so fraught with danger because there's no guarantee that the data that's been stolen won't be ex used for extortion again or it won't still be released and stuff. Um, I think more recently, um, I mean, th thinking about the whole pandemic thing as well, um, there are certainly kinds of attack opportunities that have arisen because of that because, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've been doing an awful lot of online shopping <laughs> lately. Yeah. Um, so uh, that, that's brought a new trend where like cyber criminals impersonate parcel delivery companies, which is something that really wasn't a big thing mm. in the past. Um, mm. And they'll do that in an attempt to steal financial details from their victims. And uh, those kind of attacks are typically disseminated via text message. Um, and it'll say to a victim that they've missed a delivery and must must rebook it by going to this website. Um, and then the phishing site, it, it will ask for a relatively small surcharge for the redelivery. And just because that amount is so low, it sometimes tricks victims into thinking that the site is legitimate because why would anyone want to steal one eighty or whatever, or $1.80? Um, and, or, or at least they might think the risk is minimal, so they proceed with entering their details. But of course, 
once those details have been stolen, the criminal can then potentially steal a much larger amount. Um, but criminals, they, they don't like to miss a trick. So once they've stolen the details that would be necessary for paying for a redelivery, um, some of these phishing kits, uh, phishing sites will then try and impersonate the bank that the um, uh, victim uses. And um, so then there's an opportunity to discover the online banking credentials for that victim. And then the losses can really, really add up. And I mean, I, I just thought those kind of attacks were really, I mean, re kind of clever. And, and they can be surprisingly effective simply because when a um, consumer makes an online purchase, it's not always apparent who's going to be responsible for delivering it. And, um, you know, that, that can even be true when you're placing repeat orders with the same company. For, for example, when I um, order stuff from Amazon in the UK, it could end up being delivered by one of maybe four different companies. And it doesn't indicate at the time of purchase which one would be used. So if I get a text message telling me to go to the Hermes website or the Amazon logistics website, I'm not going to necessarily think, well, I haven't you know, bought anything I'm not expecting mm. from them. Um, what else has been going on? Um, we've seen lots of um, fake shops popping up, perhaps more than usual, simply because um, there's so many people doing online shopping over this past year and a half again. Um, they will sell things like high-end sneakers or other luxury goods at ridiculously low prices. And... Um, what typically happens is, is one of three things. You either buy something from them and the payment is accepted, your money goes, and simply nothing arrives. Um, <laughs> sometimes yeah. the transaction doesn't succeed and you go away and think, okay, I'll forget about that then. But by that point, the site has all of your payment details and it's effectively operated as a phishing site, um, except ironically you might think, less of it you, you might not necessarily think to cancel your cards just because that payment didn't go through um, and then sometimes of course the payment does go through properly and the goods arrive but they're either counterfeit or really really poor quality um interesting another thing um is stuff like um <laughs> well i guess if you think about it this way um why why bother going to the effort of making a fake shop when you can just use someone else's um so one of the things we've been tackling lately are things called javascript skimmers so um basically an online shopping website a legitimate one would be compromised and someone would place this piece of javascript on there so when the shopper enters their payment details the um skimmer surreptitiously sends a copy to the cyber criminal possibly even if the customer doesn't actually complete the transaction and then um, even the most careful of users can be victims of those kind of attacks because the website is one they know and trust and it could look completely um, benign. There's no, there's no visual indication of the presence of that skimmer. Um, so that's another thing that we've been um, detecting lots of and um, blocking in the Netcraft browser extension. That's interesting. That's actually, that's something that I was going to ask um, because of this particular audience, you know, it's... I'm assuming a pretty tech savvy audience. And, and I think there are some of us like to think that it would be more difficult to trick us into uh, divulging some of this information, but, but we're humans, right. And, and we can fall prey to, to things, even if we're doing everything right, we're, we're doing uh, using two factor authentication where we're careful, uh, we're aware. Um, I think, I think that's something um, that all of us are concerned about. And I wondered if you could speak to, the types, other types of things where, where even the the most, you know, internet savvy of us could still be victims. Um, yeah, that's a really good, good one. Um, I mean, I've, I've seen, you know, you can imagine it'd be quite hard to trick someone like me with a phishing attack because I've seen so many, but every now and, <laughs> yes, and then I do I see so. some where I'm like, wow, that's really clever. That's amazing. And I mean, it, I, I, I shouldn't really be saying this kind of thing, but it could possibly have even caught me out if I was having a bad day. Um, so, I mean, one of the first things I ever saw, way, way back at the start of my time at Netcraft, probably um, right at the start of 2005, I think, um, I saw this amazing PayPal phishing site which exploited a bug in Internet Explorer on Windows XP, which, you know, remember back then it actually had, 
a very big user base. Um, anyway, the bug allowed um, containers on the web page to be moved outside of the browser's viewport. So you could you could get a um, you know a long white rectangular div and move it up outside of the browser's viewport and get it to cover up the browser's own address bar. And then, of course, mm -hmm. you can then put text in that and make it look like the phishing site is hosted, um, well, wherever it wants to be. In this case, of course, it claimed it was at paypal.com. And so that was that was super effective because um, everything you're looking for when you're trying to decide whether something's a phishing site or not, the address bar is one of the first things you'll look at. And if it says you are where the legitimate site yeah. is, then really there's no reason to um, suspect otherwise. Um, so that, yeah. that kind of thing's interesting because it still happens nowadays. Um, there's there's this um, Flubber Android malware, which basically overlays things on top of online banking apps to try and steal your data. Um, so, you know, criminals are still using these kind of overlay techniques and moving things around, trying to get in the way and cover stuff up. Um, a similar kind of technique was used, um, I, I, well, a bit more recently, but probably still, five or six years ago, um, in some Steam phishing attacks. So the, um, mm -hmm. the Steam online gaming client thing. Um, uh, so basically a movable iframe was used to emulate a browser, a, a pop-up browser window. So it gave the impression that it was a genuine Steam open ID login form, even with a um, extended validation SSL certificate. But of course, when you entered your details into it, it actually go off to a completely different website <laughs> um i think maybe another really really good one um i i took a video of it at the time but i don't have it to hand unfortunately um there were some cross-site scripting vulnerabilities on ebay so um you could plant arbitrary javascript into an ebay listing effectively so when someone wow. viewed that listing it would execute the script and do whatever the attacker wanted you to do. Um, so, I mean, one, a, a lot of the um, eBay-based cybercrime I've seen are things to do with selling um, motorhomes, RVs, or um, expensive cars at knockdown prices. Um, so <clears throat> what people would do is they would list things, these dodgy listings, and then the victim would browse to the dodgy listing because they're already on the genuine eBay website, just by clicking on a listing in the search results, you wouldn't expect to then end up going off to a different website or anything weird happening. But um, So eBay would return that listing to a victim's browser. The um, dodgy listing would then redirect the browser to the attacker's website, and it would pass the eBay item number to a PHP script on their site. And then the attacker's website would use that item number to fetch the same directory uh, same listing directly from the ebay website but at that point the attacker would modify the page so that it contains um some slightly different stuff so what happens is the victim ends up seeing a page which says um contact me at this address to um, buy this thing which is something you can't ordinarily do on ebay um and then what would normally happen is the um fraudster would solicit payment via bank transfer and then disappear and it would turn out that the vehicle never existed or it wasn't theirs in the first place. <clears throat> um, there was an, a more direct version where um, the listing page was automatically replaced with a spoof eBay login form, and that was pretty cool um, in, in a technology sense because, um, of course, it transmitted the credentials to an external site, and that really was one of the ones where I thought it was so slick. I think even the most wary people could have fallen for that one because because let's face it ebay's always randomly asking you to log in after you click yeah. on links within the site isn't it <laughs> yeah um, and that, that kind of went on for a f yeah it's bad and that went on shockingly for a few years until they stopped it by further restricting what kind of tags and so on you could actually include in a listing um but out of curiosity i had a quick play around with that in the ebay development sandbox and found that you could still bypass it um but I never actually got around to telling them because I couldn't work out how. <laughs> um, That's yeah, not good. It? No. Um, well, now that we're actually, all horrified, I wondered if. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I was going to say. Um, thinking about it, I think 
an eBay um, fish was, again, one of the first clever examples I saw back in 2005, um, simply because it used their own login form to launch the attack. So the phishing emails would direct you to the genuine eBay login form, but it would include a parameter which basically told it to go to a different website after you'd logged in. So when you log into the eBay website, your credentials are actually sent to the real eBay website but then you were redirected to a phishing site afterwards. And so if the phishing site basically copied the eBay login page, you might just think, well, actually, um, oh, I must have typed in my password wrong. And so you type it again, because at that point, having previously checked that you were on the real eBay website, you wouldn't suspect that you might not be on it anymore. So you'd probably enter your credentials and then um, your account would get hacked. Um, well, I, what I was going to say earlier is now that we're all horrified, um, maybe now's a good time to plug the browser extension you mentioned um, and tell us how it might help us avoid some of these things. Okay, yeah. So, um, I mean, this is basically what what we've been doing since 2005 on the anti-phishing front. So it started off as the NetGraph toolbar, and that would have been installed in Internet Explorer. And it would sit at the top of the browser and tell you where a website is hosted. But more importantly, if it was known to be a phishing site, it would block you and prevent you from visiting that site, therefore saving you from losing all of your credentials and money and so on. Um, nowadays, of course, it's called the Netcraft extension. Um, it's available for all modern browsers. Um, we also have a Netcraft app, so you can get the same kind of protection within mobile browsers, and it also... Um, stop the stuff at the level where it comes in. So if you receive a WhatsApp message or text message which directs you to a phishing site, it can actually nip it in the bud at that stage without you even getting a chance to uh, visit it. Um, both of the things also make it easy to report stuff to us. So although we proactively go out looking for phishing sites and there's various cool methods we use for that, uh, the, the extension community is also kind of like a, a neighborhood watch scheme. So if any of them find something that we haven't blocked yet, they can report it and then we will analyze it and block it if appropriate. So I, I, I'm wondering, uh, we're getting some good questions in the back channel here. Um, and, and one of them actually pertains to what you just said. That's an interesting thing that you say there's a neighborhood watch thing in the sense that um, you and other providers of extensions uh, can collaborate on some things. So one question here is, um, uh, should we all be using NoScript or similar? And NoScript is another one of those um, uh, extensions. Uh, so I'm wondering if, if you have thoughts about that or do you cover enough of the bases yourself or do you need other extensions? I'm not, I'm not really clear because a lot of people use uh, tracking protection, but this is a different issue. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a really good point because, and I and I'm kind of torn on the answer to this because when I'm testing web applications, I kind of need my browser to behave as a normal browser would do. So I tend to have all of the scripting and so on enabled, um, not least because it makes it then easier for me to verify whether or not there is a cross-site scripting vulnerability present. Um, but certainly disabling scripting altogether or using extension to only disable potentially unsafe scripts is a good idea because it will reduce your attack surface. Some of the... Um, attacks we've seen are, as I said earlier, JavaScript based, such as the shopping site skimmers. Um, the Netcraft extension will prevent those kind of attacks anyway. So um, if that's the only kind of thing you're worried about, then the Netcraft extension is good. And you probably aren't going to then run into a risk of ordinary websites not working properly, just because some script it depends on is um, disabled. So the, the, the tracking is a a, a big concern for people in fishing. We've been talking about fishing for a while. We can talk more about that or come back to it. Um, but tracking is something that um, it's why we have the GDPR. It's why we have the CCPA. Um, it's what is creeping a lot of people out. And, um, and I was thinking about um, how different tracking payloads are delivered. There's a real trend lately toward, um, sort of away from blogging and participating and for writers anyway, and participating in publications are just doing their own. And so they're using 
MailChimp or they're using um, one of the other um, one of the other services to do subscription based newsletters, and all of those come with almost all of them come with appended a, you know to a URL a long string of stuff that's meant to report back fairly innocent stuff in some cases, like what you clicked on and what you didn't click on, that kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. But it's, it, occurs, it occurs to me that that's possibly a vector for malware as well. Is there any, are there any cases of that? Is that the kind of thing you're following at all? Um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure how the malware would creep in and that kind of thing. Um, I, I mean, if, if it is a legitimate MailChimp link, it should be fine. Um, but, I suppose myself, like many other people, we tend to use um, sort of junk or almost throwaway email addresses for things like mailing lists that we, so then we don't have to necessarily worry about what happens there. I mean, we've seen cases where um, these companies which send out mailings on behalf of other companies, they are compromised. And so um, loads of email addresses end up getting lots of spam for some bizarre reason. Um, but we, <clears throat> we have seen... Um, malware and phishing distributed via stuff like that before um but usually because someone's account's been compromised and used to uh, send stuff that it shouldn't be sending so it's another question from the back channel here is um do you recommend an ad blocker for security reasons and i would add to that there are some ad blockers that that also block tracking and there's some that don't and in some provide options for that but for security reasons in general, do you recommend them? I can certainly understand why people would use them. Again, I don't. Um, I, I've, I've seen malware attacks succeed where um, the malware has been delivered through, for example, an iframe, which was housing an advert, um, because either the advertising network has been compromised and malware is being served via the iframe, or... Um, someone's literally just paid for an advert and it's not been vetted properly and it's just served malware straight into the browser. Um, those kind of things are <clears throat> more of a risk if um, your browser software isn't up to date because that's only really going to be a problem if there's an exploitable vulnerability in the browser that hasn't been patched yet. Um, it could possibly affect the website you're on if, um, you know, if, even in a fully patched browser, if, say... Uh, there's sensitive information revealed on that website, which the ad could then access via JavaScript. Um, so blocking ads certainly will make you safer. It will reduce your attack surface once again. Um, but again, one of the reasons why I tend not to use an ad blocker is because, um, because of the fact that they are used for attacking stuff and so on. I kind of want to see where these ads are appearing and how they have a play in things. Um, if I was particularly paranoid about visiting a website, then yes, I would probably <laughs> stick stick my browser in a virtual machine and um, turn all the things off and only access it that way. It's funny. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I use less multiple email addresses. That turned out to be too complicated for me to manage, um, though I do have several that I use, but um, I have several browsers going at once. I like to see what people are you know, what, what muggles are doing and not just wizards and what they're up against. And it's, it, there's so many variables involved. It's hard to keep up with that. Um, I, I know Catherine's got a question coming up, but first I have to let the uh, listeners and viewers uh, know that we have a really cool thing called Club Twit. Um, Club Twit gives you ad-free podcasts. We have, you know, all kinds of outtakes. We have Ad free content. Ad free is probably the biggest attraction <laughs> to 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 that. We were just talking about that. Um, there's a members only Discord that's very very active. Um, we have a huge number of people who are who are fans of 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 Twit and are involved and uh, and they're all smart and they're all good looking and they're a lot of them are on our are on our Discord. It's seven dollars a month and. Um, uh, and you can get into this thing, twit.tv slash club twit. That's twit.tv slash club twit. Yeah. And also, oh, I'm not forgetting. Uh, there's an untitled Linux show as well. It happens on weekends. Uh, Jonathan Bennett, who's right now active in our back channel. He's on our front channel as a, a guest host on here as well. 
Uh, so that's a, that's a terrific show. So catch that one too. Okay. So Catherine, um, we've got a long list of questions here. We can yeah, visit. actually, well, speaking of, of Jonathan, he had a really good one and that was, um, well, being a floss weekly, uh, I wondered if you could speak a little to proprietary versus open source security. And as a follow-up, he specifically mentions iOS. And I think that's a good one because people have a sense of, uh, our Apple users have a sense that that uh, they're getting, you know, extra security baked in when they use Apple devices. And I wondered if you might talk about that a little bit, iOS in particular. Well, <laughs> I'm I'm perhaps the wrong person to ask about iOS because I don't really um, use it in a day to day sense. Um, whenever I do use it, it's just to uh, test apps and. Um, I mean, to be honest, that's a frustrating enough experience just because it is so secure <laughs> generally. Um, so I guess that kind of kind of answers that question, but kind of also doesn't. Um, in terms of the security of web servers, though, because that's probably more what I'm um, familiar with, I kind of um, think, you know, does does it have any kind of impact on what people tend to use? Because there's been there's been a very big vulnerability in Apache recently, and um, is that going to make people suddenly stop using Apache and use something else instead? Um, I don't know. I mean, I I kind of think no in in one sense because although there are some people who will take a knee jerk reaction and um, ditch Apache and then move to something else just because of a big vulnerability, um, if you've spent five years or whatever developing and maintaining a complex web application that only works on Apache, then it's not going to be practical or possible to suddenly switch it to a different platform. And um, whether it's closed source or open source, you know, Microsoft IIS versus Apache and then Nginx, um, they're all kind of in the same boat. They've all had epic vulnerabilities over the years, um, all, all three of those in particular. Um, but on the whole, those kind of vulnerabilities are fixed really quickly. Um, so the, the the Apache vulnerability earlier this month, that was a path traversal vulnerability, um, which in some cases would have allowed remote code execution on the server. So pre pretty critical. But to fix it, all you had to do was install an update, which came fairly quickly. And OK, they um, didn't quite get the fix right in the first place. You had to wait another day for it to be fixed properly. Um, but in the meantime, um, it was very easy to mitigate the vulnerability. And if your Apache server was behind something like Cloudflare that provided a web application firewall, then it was probably going to be impossible to exploit that vulnerability anyway. Um, so I don't think people tend to tend to choose, or well, they don't switch web servers based on security so much, I don't find. Um, I, I think it's mainly the features and um, performance that are the most important things that people look for when they're deciding what web service to use for a particular task. Um, I mean, as unless you're making some kind of um, national security critical system, there's no point choosing a web server that's super secure but doesn't let you do what you want. And that's kind of reflected by our stats. So if you look at any of our articles about the web server survey, you can see that shortly after the survey started, Apache, as you said, quickly became the most commonly used web server. And that was mainly due to the features it offered. Um, and it stayed on top for well over a decade until, like you said, Microsoft took the lead for a few years. Um, but just before Microsoft took the lead, there was a remote code execution vulnerability in that, and that affected over 70 million IIS websites. So um, it's clear that that didn't actually dampen its um, growth at that point. Um, and now Nginx is in the lead, I suspect, mainly because people like what it does rather than anything else. Um, and if you look on those blog posts, they there are annotations on the graphs as well, on the graphs as well. So um, you can see, for example, when the code red and NIMDA worms affected Microsoft IIS web servers, and um, it had no real impact. If, if anything, I think the numbers went up slightly. Um, and then one of the um, perhaps more notable events to take place this year um, was the mass exploitation of the uh, proxy login vulnerability that affected, a, I don't know, about 100,000 Outlook web access servers, um, which is a pretty bad thing. So that's going to be housing people's emails. Um, 
And we found web shells installed on thousands of those servers. So the criminals who um, put them there still had admin access to those servers, even after the underlying vulnerabilities had been fixed. Wow. Yeah. So, so you mentioned, you know, I was actually, I'm glad you spoke about web shells because that was on, on the list. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about uh, why those types of attacks might be overlooked and also um, what type of attack they are particularly used for? Um, I guess they're overlooked by the people who administer the servers simply because they don't know they're there a lot of the time. Um, we've seen cases where web shells have been um, on a server for months or even years, and they've just sat there. Um, no, nothing in, in some cases, nothing particularly bad's happened to a server, but that's perhaps because even the criminals don't realize the shell is there. Um, but in, in general, a web shell, um, like, so the ones that are planted in the Outlook web access attacks, they um, would have allowed complete administrative access to the server. So that would have been ripe for carrying out maybe a ransomware attack by stealing the emails from the server and then um, threatening to release them unless a you know, massive ransom in Bitcoin is paid. Um, in the general case, um, web shells are uploaded to web servers just to allow someone to execute arbitrary commands. Um, most of the time they're written in PHP um, just because that that is the most well-supported scripting language on the web, really. Um, and there's lots of vulnerable PHP web applications out there. So just by exploiting an application-level vulnerability, you may be able to plant a web shell on the server. And then what the criminals will do is they'll typically use that web shell to upload other web shells because... If someone finds that web shell and deletes it, then their access is gone. So what they like to do is scatter several copies of web shells all over the website. So, you know, you might not find them all. And if there's at least one left, then the criminal can still access the server. Um, some are a bit more advanced and they'll provide useful hacking tools and other features that make the hacker's life simple. So they may... Um, for example, have a, a button you can click which will just go off and find all of the password hashes on the server, be they in files or databases and so on. And um, it may even offer to try and um, uh, you know crack those using the web server's own CPU power, which is a bit cheeky. Um, it's being a compromised web server, um, particularly in an Outlook web access case, it, it could provide access to an internal network. So there's going to be you know hackers potentially exploring your internal network through this as well. Um, and some web shells are designed to be controlled by a botnet. So your web server could end up being used as part of a distributed denial of service attack even. Um, the, the web shells, are, you know, until recently, I think a lot of people had been overlooking them because phishing is such a big thing. But we were seeing new web shells being you know, uploaded on, on average every five minutes or so. Um, and like I say, most were written in PHP with those kind of features I described. Um, but some even have totally dynamic features because they will fetch some code from a remote server and then execute that. So they can be sort of like upgraded in situ, although in practice, I suspect, wherever that code comes from, um, it's it's basically so whoever wrote, wrote that can um, change your functionality whenever they want. Um, a real good example um, we saw a few years ago was um, a Stanford University website, which got completely infested with hacking tools and phishing sites and so on. So um, <clears throat> I think it was, it was over a period of about four months. Um, first, someone uploaded a web shell to the server. No idea how that happened. But because um, the web shell shows all the timestamps on the files, you could then get a view of the history of what happened next. Um, so what happened next was someone uploaded another web shell unexpectedly. Um, and then you ended up seeing defacement pages on there, which is a, a pretty retro thing to do, you know, uploading a web page, which says hacked by so-and-so. Right. Um, so a couple of people did that um, and they claimed to be different people. So it was clear that there were multiple criminals using either of these web shells or some other vulnerability. Um, and then someone uploaded um, 
some PHP mailer scripts, which are, you know, a, a important part of phishing attacks because most phishing attacks are still disseminated by email. So why not use someone else's web server to send all those emails? Um, and then another PHP mailer script got uploaded. But interestingly, this one had a um, <clears throat> a sort of phone home piece of JavaScript on it. So whenever it was used, it would send a request off to a remote server, basically allowing whoever wrote that script to know where it was being used. So um, they could then use it to send emails as well. So ultimately, you could end up getting loads of different criminals using your web server to send emails, which could get it um, blacklisted. Um, and then, of course, the inevitable thing happened, and suddenly lots of phishing sites started appearing on this website. Um, so they were impersonating things like Office 365, um, LinkedIn, SunTrust Bank, and just generic webmail forms, really, that tried to steal your um, email credentials. Um, I mean, that's kind of why that came to our attention in the first place, because we detected the phishing sites. But um, when we looked further into it and found the web shells, it was very clear that um, the server had been compromised for months and nobody had noticed until we told them. So, boy, I have several questions piling up here. One is sort of a, a general one. What what server operating system or distro do you consider the best for staying secure? For a is web server or just a desktop? Well, it um, I guess it could be either, but uh, I think your your focus is mostly on web servers, right? As a as a company, yeah. Because that also goes into what your company does. Because you could say I could tell these guys this, and we could share this information there. But you're making money somehow too, right? So, um, <laughs> yeah. So well, you might want well, to so, um, plug pl plug exactly what it is that Netcraft does as a company, because I'm sure okay. it does so, more than just yeah. I mean, rather than answering that in a sense of like, oh, I would run this because of you know, it being secure. I, I think I've got some really good insights on this because I test lots of different websites and platforms that run on them and various sorts of web applications that run on those. Um, and I would say probably one of the more secure ones, certainly in an application level, is actually the um, .NET stuff on Microsoft IIS. Um, ASP uh, or ASPX rather, um, they're just, I mean, some, sometimes the tests can be quite boring because they're like a, a really hard nut to crack. Um, on the other hand, I really, really love testing web applications written in PHP because they're usually so damned vulnerable. Um, it just makes it a bit more exciting. Um, although at the end of the day, you end up having to write lots about them to save what you found. So I guess a boring test is good because you don't have to write so much, but, um, you know, if you know, if you avoid PHP or, or in particular libraries written in PHP that you don't necessarily know intimately, um, I, I wouldn't trust those. Um, I don't know. I, I'm not sure what's best, really. Um, I, I just from what I've tested, though, I do like. I am surprised how good the Microsoft stuff can can be if it's done properly. But like any kind of framework it is possible to do things the wrong way. And so, yes, I have seen um, websites on Windows Server that are horrendously insecure, but that's just because someone's done silly things and not used the frameworks properly. I'm, I'm wondering, is, so in, in your uh, monthly web server stats thing, um, at least the, the, the red line called Microsoft, which just beat the crap out of Apache from like 2016 to 2018, then dropped off like a cliff and it's gone down to almost nothing. But is that IIS? I mean, it is IIS, I suppose, but is it, I'm sure that a large percentage of the rest of what we're seeing there is Microsoft in some way. So what, what, what are we looking at there? Um, yeah. So everything we um, count under Microsoft is mostly Microsoft IIS, but there's also a small portion of um, other Microsoft based servers like Microsoft IS API. Um, but yeah, it's mostly IIS. Um, and the numbers on the graph, I think you're looking at, they are the number of host names that run on those things. Um, as you mm -hmm. can see, they do fluctuate quite a bit. It's It's perhaps not the most stable metric because if you register a domain name, 
you could suddenly deploy lots of different websites on that under different subdomains without really costing you much at all. Um, and they would count as websites possibly. So that's why we have um, other metrics available in our survey too. Um, so we also provide the numbers of active sites. And by active site, we mean things that aren't like the main holding pages or anything boring and templated like that. Um, so that's a slightly more stable metric. Um, we also, um, a few years back, we started counting the number of unique domains. So although example.com could have a thousand subdomains under it, all of those thousand websites would only count as one unique domain. Um, and then the most stable metric, I guess, is the web facing computers one, because it's, it's not easy for someone to game the system by suddenly adding millions of computers here and there, um, whether they be virtual machines or real physical computers. Um, I think there's about 11 million web facing computers on the web at the moment. Um, so when we're doing our survey, what we do is we um, connect all of the websites and obviously we get the um, server banner back in the responses so we can see whether they're running Apache or Nginx and so on. Um, but when we're connecting, we also analyze the TCP IP characteristics of that connection. Um, so we can use that to um, not just determine which operating system the server is likely to be running, but we can also um, use it to work out how many web facing computers there are. Because if, if you take a single physical web server, for example, that server could have multiple IP addresses and it could ultimately serve or host thousands of different websites. Um, but by analyzing that stuff, we can actually tell that all of those thousands of websites are hosted on the um, same computer and therefore correspond to just a single installation of Apache, Nginx, or whatever happens to be running on it. I, I have to admit that I didn't learn how to pronounce Nginx until just now. <laughs> I've been reading this as Nginx because I, I, I don't know why, but so I, and I said that earlier and forgive me Nginx folks for, for saying that wrong. Well, so I think, and, and I'm I think the most controversial thing is how it's um, written because um, some people write it fully lowercase, some write it fully uppercase, some write it with backwards Cyrillic letters and all sorts. <laughs> It reminds me of when I, I mean, a thousand years ago I was in radio when it was one station in New York, WMCA, that always insisted that they are in lowercase. You know, not that it mattered at all. You know, but it's it's one of the one of those things. It's a so so what a, I mean, can you say what accounts for why Nginx has gone up um, versus others going up, and Cloudflare is going up? Is it just well they're popular, or they promote well, or they're useful, or is there a security reason for some of these? Is the other has it really gained a lot too? So that that's that could be anything, I suppose. Yeah. Um, I mean, so I'll try and do those one by one. So Cloudflare, for instance, that's just grown because um it is a content delivery network. It provides um lots of nodes around the world where people's websites will be served through effectively. And ultimately those um those will count as Cloudflare, even if the website, the, the origin server that provides that content, it could be hosted, it, it will be hosted in just one place and it could be running any kind of web server. But from our perspective, the web facing computer that that um, website is being served from would be a Cloudflare node. So we would count that as Cloudflare. Um, but the Cloudflare server was originally based on Nginx, which I guess. Um, demonstrates how good they thought Nginx was as well. Um, but we have um, started counting it separately in recent years just because the code base has diverged so much. Um, it's not really fair to count that under Nginx anymore. Um, uh, Tenjin is another web server which is based on Nginx. So that's used a lot in China. Um, again, they obviously thought Nginx was very, very good and worth copying. As for just pure Nginx and the fact that it is now hosting most of the websites in the world. Again, I think that's just because um, people like the fact that it is very good at what it does. Um, if you want to make a website which serves lots and lots of concurrent connections, then um, it does seem to be a very popular choice. 
So we're, we're, we're actually getting down toward the end of the show. I was not watching the clock as closely as I should have. This happens when the show is, <laughs> when the guest is good and, the, and there's lots of action on the back channel and there's so many things we could be asking and haven't yet. So um, you gave us a, a, a huge number of questions yourself um, or just topics we could touch on here. Are there any that we haven't touched on yet that you'd like to expand on? Because there's an awful lot to go by there. Um, um, I, I guess something that's relevant because you, one of you, can't remember who, sorry, mentioned two factor authentication as a protection mechanism earlier. Um, mm. and so I thought it might be topical to point out that that actually isn't always going to save you. Um, I mean, we're, we're all fairly wary, right? So we will be okay. But, um, even sort of 15 or so years ago, we, um, started seeing phishing sites which attempted to defeat two-factor authentication. And um, it's definitely something we're seeing a lot more of lately, you could, just because more and more websites are using 2FA. Um, so the thing we found 15 odd years ago was um, an online banking, a, a phishing site which impersonated an online bank, and it would intercept the online banking passcodes generated by the victim's physical RSA security token. And so it would take that code from the victim and then it would pass it on to the genuine website so the criminal could use that code before it expired, effectively allowing the criminal to log into the real site on behalf of the um, victim. And um, today we see a lot more um, real-time interaction between phishing sites and the criminals who deploy them. So, for example, if an um, online banking website uses text messages to send out two-step authentication codes via SMS, then the, the phishing site will start as normal by grabbing the victim's username and password, um, but then it will take their mobile phone number. And then the phishing site will send that number to an encrypted Telegram chat, which allows the criminal to receive it promptly. And then the criminal enters that code into a real online banking site, which of course causes the victim to receive the two-step authentication code they were expecting. Um, and then... During those stages, uh, the phishing site usually imposes um, like an artificial delay of 20 or 30 seconds just to give the criminal enough time to make use of the data without making the victim suspicious. Um, and of course, using Telegram as a means of transmitting the authentication code means that a criminal can, again, make use of it before it expires, which might not necessarily be possible via email or if the code is logged to a file on the phishing site. Um but today, email is probably still the most common method for phishing sites to steal data from people. Um, we, we have, of course, seen these ones where Telegram is used. Um, Discord is another chat system we've seen used to uh, steal data from phishing sites. Um, but we also see ones where they'll transmit data just off to another website where it would be logged in a database or a file. Um, yeah, it's interesting. It's interesting with two factor that I think for most of us that the way we see it as a user is, well, this is kind of a pain in the butt, but I feel better about it because I'm, I feel safer. And there's that moment of safety that you feel at the end of it. And, and what you're telling us is, nah, <laughs> it's not, it, it's, it's better, but it's certainly not foolproof. And I suppose nothing is, I mean, that's sort of, I mean, Every time we do a show this long on security, I wonder how is it that we're not completely hosed all the time? Because there's so many vulnerabilities <laughs> or so many ways to be vulnerable in all the complexities behind the way we interact with entities on the web or just with web services or whatever. I, it's an interesting question. I, uh, I'm i kind of amazed the whole thing works. Yeah, Maybe I mean, having tested... guys like you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, having, having tested online banking websites for several different banks i've i've been quite horrified by the kind of vulnerabilities you find on them sometimes e even ridiculous things like um being able to send people negative amounts of money which of course means that you're effectively stealing from their bank account um and but then i, I at the end of the day i kind of think well the safety in numbers isn't there why, why would anyone target me with the amount in my bank account <laughs> Yeah, this is security by obscurity. Well, so we have a, a few other questions we ask at the at the end of the show. So these are sort of our control questions with all our guests. One is, do you have anything to say about blockchain? This is something um, we haven't touched on this show. Probably not really. Um, 
it's not my area of expertise for sure. Um, the uh, the only sort of tangential um, thing I have to do with it is um, we do, of course, see phishing sites which impersonate blockchain, um, the website, and um, what one of them was um, particularly amazing because. Um, most phishing sites, like I said, are disseminated by email, but we did see a particularly hilarious one, which was um, uh, spread around via search, uh, you know, sponsored search results. So if you searched for um, blockchain on Bing.com or even DuckDuckGo, you you would get a couple of ads. One of the adverts, um, it said something like blockchain wallet, um, and it said, attention, the other site is a phishing site. But then above that was another advert saying blockchain, my wallet. The other ads are all a phishing site. So it was like two different <laughs> fishers were trying to compete against each other and tell, <laughs> you know, warn warn the users that each of their ads was a phishing scam. So I think at the end of the day, probably neither of those had much luck. <laughs> it's self, self-defeating. Um, and our final uh, question is... Um, what is your favorite scripting language and text editor? Oh, interesting. Um, probably Sublime Text at the moment, um, as I do tend to use Windows, believe it or not. Um, sorry, what was the other question? My favorite scripting language? A scripting language, yeah. Um, ooh, that is a good question. Um, um, I guess, uh, I mean, I don't know how much you know about um, the infrastructure at Net craft in terms of the historical makeup of it but it was a very no, much nothing. pearl oriented <laughs> it was a very much yeah. pearl oriented place to start off with um so i guess i got into the habit of using pearl for various bits and bobs i still use it now and then for ad hoc tiny bits and bobs um so uh, and then again for web stuff i guess um I mean, I, I do admire the convenience of PHP if you just want to try something out. But but in my case, it's usually like I want to try out a bit of PHP because I've seen this phishing site, which includes something weird and nefarious. It's obviously um, trying to do something sneaky. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting. How does this work? Because um, there's lots of stuff uh, stuff hidden in phishing sites because, of course, you can't trust criminals. They'll give these phishing kits away so other people can use them, but they will hide bits of obfuscated code in there so that when they're deployed, they'll actually send a copy of the stolen credentials to the author of that phishing site rather than whoever's deployed it as well. Um, so that's kind of sneaky. Um, and the code gets hidden in all sorts of weird places, like you might even find an image file like a PNG, which has PHP code in it. Um, but you wouldn't know because if, you open it in a tech, if you open it in a web browser or just um, an image editor, it will just look like an image. But the phishing site might actually be fetching code from that file and executing it. Um, it's it's just interesting to see how they write these um, uh, bits to deceive. Um, there'll be code that's laid out in a weird fashion, so it looks like it does something sensible. But actually, if you delve into it, it's going to send two emails instead of one and so on. Well, this is, um, it seems appropriate to me that this is our Halloween show, which is all <laughs> about disguises. Scary. You know, <laughs> I can imagine some, you know, kid going out as a malicious shell script to, to somebody's door or some other thing like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, it has been great having you on the show, Paul. And, uh, and, I'm, and I, th- there are lots of, guests that come to us. I actually sought, uh, sought you guys out cause I've, I've been appreciating that craft for a long time. So it's great to, great to have you on the show. Have to well, have you back. It's soon. nice to meet a, uh, long-term subscriber as well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot. So, so, uh, uh, so Catherine, how's, how was that one for you? I think more questions left unasked on the show than. Yeah, I know. I have so many more questions actually. Um, I, I enjoy these topics because it's, you know, it's one of those things we we all need to know these things, right? It's literally to exist in the digital world now. We we need to be more aware and 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 more careful and and yeah, I would, you know, I'd, I would love to ask more about just basic tips to uh, stay safer. Because again, we think, you know, oh well, I'm a nerd, I'm a software engineer, I can I can maneuver the world without without getting owned. 
Um, but maybe I can't, <laughs> maybe a lot of us can't, maybe we're all a little overconfident and that's why we see so many of these major, major attacks. It's, uh, I mean, every time we do one of these, I think, oh my gosh, we are so screwed. <laughs> you know, I, I'm glad that we have people like Paul and outfits like Netcraft on the wall there, as they say, to, you know, to, to be vigilant in ways that, that we can't, you can, you're more vigilant than I am. And because you're, you're an actual pro I'm, I'm a muggle at heart actually, even though I check this stuff out at all, all the time, but it's, it's a scary world. Yeah, we, I mean, we all make mistakes. I, you know, I'm, I'm not going to publicly describe the mistake, <laughs> the mistakes I've made, but I make mistakes. I've, you know, I've made security mistakes and oops, that wasn't supposed to go in the public repo. You know, that, you know, it's, it's, we yeah. all do it. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, I've made those where I, oh, I clicked on that. Oh my gosh, you know, oh, you know what just happened. And so far, nothing that I know of has happened, but there are those moments where I think, oh my God, that actually was a phishing email or that was a phishing something else. No, you know? it's getting There's more and more sophisticated. Are, yeah, we've gotten so we can recognize these things, but it, you know, disguises are there for a purpose. So what have you got to plug? This one went long, so we can't chat too long in this thing, so. Ah, well, I mean, we have, we have our, the other podcast that we do reality to cast.com. We can always plug that. This is by the way, the, the two other of one, us here. <laughs> yes. The two of us. Um, and well, and some, some other occasional co-hosts, Sean joins us. Yeah. Um, the other thing is just use Drupal. Oh, Hey, plug Aquia. <laughs> yeah. 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 They, they, yeah. uh, they employ me generously. Um, <laughs> it's a great place to work. Great place, great software to use. Um, yeah, use Drupal. Oh, Upgrade was... to Drupal nine, please. That, that's that's my main yeah. point right there. It's a special call out to our old employer, Linux Journal, to do that. Um, so um, I want to let you all know that next week we have uh, Paula Hunter on of Moja Loop. This is uh, I was actually talking to her on the phone about something else, and I decided wait, she'd be great on the show. She's going to be here next week. So look at a Moja Loop first, and then give us questions when the when the show starts. So until next week, thanks for being here. I'm Doc Searles. This has been Floss Weekly, and we'll see you soon. So you got yourself the brand new latest and greatest iPhone or Samsung smartphone because you heard about all of the beautiful photography those things can create. But for some reason, you're just not quite getting it done with when you try to make your photos. Or you got yourself a brand new camera because you were interested in getting started in photography. But eh, your little new inexpensive camera still isn't quite cutting it. Well, you need to check out my show, Hands on Photography, here on Twit. I'm going to show you how to be a better photographer and a better post processor. And quite frankly, just help you get the most out of that new camera that's, that's either on your phone or the brand new one that you just got for your your birthday or gifts or what have you and it's going to be a lot of fun so head on over to twit.tv hop that's twit.tv hop and subscribe today <laughs>